in the last answer to the last question, what Ms. Bush said is she's trying to solve a problem. And she understands and she's compassionate that by solving the problem, she will have an effect on other people. I am just trying to solve a problem. And I know from my history that it will have an effect. I just don't directly try to have an effect. But the evidence is it has an effect, but I don't let it influence how hard I work in solving the problem as well as I can. You're, so, you're Gutenberg, not Martin Luther. I will tell about <laughs> Gutenberg. In 1297, this is not, uh, this is not, I didn't tell you to say Gutenberg, but I remember. You didn't. 1297, Gutenberg was born and he did his Bible in, in, uh, in 1340. He, he invented the press, which is a per, sort of like a wine press with his brother. He died bankrupt. He not only had to do the press, he had to invent the paper because there was only vellum, and he had to have paper that you could dampen and put in the press. He cut the type 126 letter alphabet, which was the combination of every letter next to each other, so it was the most perfectly set book ever. And he had to invent uh, paper ink, well that was it. And then he died bankrupt, but the interesting story is that the Catholic Church uh, saw that this was a way of printing things. So they started printing things called indulgences. Now these indulgences were like confessions. They sold these for much, much money. And Martin Luther pinned on the church many years later a thing. And the first thing was the printing of indulgences being a horrible thing by the Catholic Church. But that's not even the story. What's interesting about the story is that 99 years later, Aldous invented pagination. Before that, there was no way of finding things in that. What does finding things lead to? The dictionary, the thesaurus. Google. The, and Google. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the last conversation. Word, exactly. Uh, we can go has to go to have a carnival sideshow together. Um, the the last conversation about medicine uh, and health seems to me uh, segues nicely to one of your several projects that I want to spend the next 15 minutes talking about, which is called Five by Five by Five, which is about. Uh, creating a, 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 a matrix of medical information in countries overseas. Is that well, more or less correct? I realized at my, I realized at my last conference I was talking to, on stage, to uh, uh, Zeke Emanuel, who was the point person, Rahm Emanuel's brother for medicine in the Obama administration. I asked him, well, what do they do in other health care? How is health care treated in other countries? This was in the middle of the whole congressional stuff, and he wouldn't talk about the United States plan. He said, well, we don't really know. And then I realized I really don't know. So I decided to take five countries, Japan, the United States, Norway, Great Britain, and India, and look at five things that can happen, first year of life, last year of life, diabetes, two, heart attack, and trauma breaking your hip, and see at five different income levels how they were treated, and I'm working on that now. I've done the wheel of the first few things, uh, and I can give you one of the wheels, uh, which we gave away uh, at, at uh, TedMed. It's not dissimilar to the 19-20-21 project, which is a right. much bigger That's project. my next question. No, go ahead. 1920, I realized that uh, no two cities, this is the truth. It will not seem like it could possibly be true. It is true. No two cities in the world do their maps to the same scale or have the same legends. There is no methodology for drawing the border around a city, and every major city has grown over its political boundaries. If you don't have a border, you don't have an area within which you can map. You don't know where to map, but therefore, if you don't have an area, you can't have density. The legends are not the same on these maps. No two cities can talk to each other. Every company that calls itself global isn't. So I created a project called 192021, 19 cities that will have more than 20 million people in the 21st century. And I have two wonderful partners. One is Jack Dangerman, who owns Esri, the largest map maker in the world. He has 4,000 employees, and he owns basically all GIS systems. And the other, I think one of the great media companies, uh, and that is uh, a Radical Media, and John Kamen and Jack Dangerman and I are doing this project, which will co consist of not only a free website developing the performance criteria and the uh, templates for doing this, but a series of films, a 45-minute uh, big documentary, plus a film series, plus a website, and 19 urban observatories, which will be live places around the world where you can see this information live and talk to people and, in other cities. And the idea is so it's a that, very big project. So that uh, as, as we know, since half of the people on Earth now live in cities compared 51%. to less than 10% uh, at the turn of the previous century, um, is, is the idea to 
to make everybody be able to compare apples to apples to apples for some to solve problems, or is it just because you would like them all to be able to be speaking the same cartographical language? None of those three things. Um, <laughs> understanding precedes action. So I'm not trying to change cities. I'm trying to allow people to understand their cities. Most people come up when, they, when you talk to them about doing something about cities, they say, well, this, we have this project and it solves this crime problem here and there, but it's not applicable because they really don't understand it relative to anything else. So when Bogota or Cartagena solves their mass transit problems, it's hard to well, transfer that's, elsewhere. No, you can't. Yeah. And you only understand, Werman's first law is you only understand something relative to something you understand, okay? And that's true. And uh, so I am, uh, uh, I'm just, and the, the other parts of your question is I'm doing it for my own self-satisfaction. In 1962, I did a book, that's a long time ago, probably before you were born, no, not quite. Not quite. Uh, but in 1962, I did a book of the plans of 50 cities of the world all to the same scale, and nobody's done it since. And, but, but who do you expect to be the users of Me. this? No, 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 seriously. It'll have use. I mean, if I put it out there online, if it is an exhibit, if it becomes a standard, it'll have use. But I am not directing that use, nor do I care about that use, because I'm on to my next project. I'm not going to watch the use and say, oh, they're using that and good is coming from it. I'm doing something else then. Uh, Maybe I take up tap dancing. But it's something else. It's, I don't, I'm not looking backwards. I don't really You're just like a promiscuous creature who wants to get your genetic material out on the earth as much as possible, I guess, really. <laughs> Um, now, I mean, it's, it's so dumb what I'm saying. It's not a, it's not a complicated thing. I don't know why it's so, so fussy. People are fussed about that. I'm interested in it. Okay. Um, you. It's so simple to be selfish. You, it, well, you. Th this is all about cities. You, you're interested in cities. It's, it's devoted to making cities comprehensible. Yeah. You live in a non-urban place with your wonderful <laughs> wife in this kind of glorious hermitage. Uh, in, in uh, kind of uh, philosopher king isolation. Why don't you live in a city? <laughs> a real city, that is. I did that. You did that. You, LA was all you could take, Philadelphia no, was all Philadelphia, you could take? Philadelphia, New York, LA. Yeah. Uh, Seriously, though. It's a disconnect somewhat. Uh, did anybody see the New York Times story on my house? A few people did. Well, you know, it's. it's I live in, a, I, I, just the way he says. There's a disconnect. But it also allows me to be totally non-sociable. Uh, we have no dinner parties. We don't entertain anybody. Every, nobody in the town has been to our backyard. Uh, but then you organize uh, meetings that are these little temporary cities. Yeah, but uh, they're the cities you, beginnings and ends. And you're, the, and you're the mayor. House. They're not in my house. Yeah, right. I don't know. It's, uh, it works for you? I'm OK. I really, I've had a good year. <laughs> The, the, what else do I want to do? Five by five, you did that. This is the year you turned 75. As you, an interesting thing about okay. people. This, yeah. is like, this is new and this, will, this is a scoop for you. Next year, beginning in January, seven of the 12 issues of National Geographic will be about the number 7 billion because we turn 7 billion next year on Earth. And uh, isn't that interesting? Well, I just thought you'd like to know. And if everybody has, everybody has two square feet, you can, uh, uh, you can be in 500 square miles. Seven billion people, and if you have six square feet, which means you can pick, lift up your leg and dance, you would fill up the state of Rhode Island, which is where I live. It brings it back there. And then I also want to make it perfectly clear that although I am trying to destroy time for myself in conferences and how people meet, talk, gather, and do this kind of thing and object to it, I really love TED Talks. I didn't create it. June Cohn created TED Talks. They are wonderful. They have been wonderful ways for people to gain information and waste time globally. <laughs> and, and, and I think they're amazing. I just don't, f there's a little disconnect between the best kind of conversation, whether it's three minutes or 30 minutes or two and a half hours, and the prescription of 18 minutes that I created. And I'm trying to distance myself from that creation. But I do love TED Talks, and they're perfect for, 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 for uh, your boop uh, you, you have a, You and I share a kind of map Jones. We both like cartography and always have, I think. Are, are, as you see geolocation become one of the new buzzwords in the digital world, 
Are there any geolocation apps that interest you, excite you? Yeah, just look at the ones from, from ESRI, E-S-R-I. They're fantastic. One of the speeches last, last year, not this last October, but a year ago, one of the speeches was by Bill Davenhold, head of the one division of ESRI on healthcare, and it's taken off like crazy, in which he went through his life of where he lived and showed where he lived affected his health, and that where you live should be part of your health record. I can understand saying, oh my God, I'm 75. How did you get through that and, 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 and oh, wait, wait. how were you reborn? I, I really dreaded becoming 75. It seemed extremely old, and I know you're 86. Uh, uh, is anybody older than 86 here? I doubt it. I once did a conference called Geeks and Geezers, and everybody was under 30 and over 70, and I had two people over 90. And, uh, and that's when Google was first announced by the Bobsy twins because they were under 30. Um, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was over. I've thought it's, it was been over several times in my life. Uh, I thought it was just, I went up to New, Rhode Island initially 17 years ago to retire. And uh, it didn't happen. And, uh, and then I sort of went fallow for a little bit and uh, and uh, as you know, because of my personality, nobody honors me. And uh, no, it's just the way it is. And, uh, um, and turning 75 of how to celebrate, how to acknowledge it, what to do was ominous. And so I decided that I would say yes to speeches. And I got over it that way. And I'd say everybody, wherever I went, I gave a speech. I've given 10, 15 speeches this year. And they would sing me happy birthday. And uh, in fact, if you go on YouTube, there's a beautiful song that was created just for me that they showed it. It was created. I didn't know about a complete surprise. Uh, look at Richard Soulworm and birthday. And there's a great song, funny song. It was, was a, a, a video done for me uh, this year. And the Jersey Boys. The Broadway cast sang Happy Birthday to me uh, and recorded it and sang it. And Yo-Yo Ma played Happy Birthday on so the cello. And yes, it, yeah, it was very good. And then I got Did sick of it. it. No, I got sick of it. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm really, I, I think I'm over it. I think I'm really over it. But in the process, I've had the most wonderful year. This has been the most creative for me personally, feeling the most creative year of my life, of thinking up things and being able to say to myself, just snap out of it and destroy everything you've done and reinvent it. Really start again from scratch. And I have that energy of beginning. In the beginning of this book, I'm gonna give you my last book called 33. There's a big uh, uh, quote that says, beginnings, 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 I love beginnings. And it's a quote from Luke Kahn. And I did the first book on Luke Kahn. I studied with Lou. He's my mentor. And that doing that book, which I just dictated, I didn't write a word. I just did two dictation sessions, had it transcribed, designed it, and and, and, was, was losing and 90, that was good. Was losing 90 pounds a cause or effect, an effect of your reinvigoration? I think it affected my mind in a very positive way. I think I got more, I, I, I wasn't, it wasn't for health. But just getting up one morning and saying, eat less, that's the way I took off weight, uh, eat less, that, that I shed 90 pounds. I was really a fat pig. And, uh, a cute fat pig. Yeah, yeah. albeit. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but it really had an effect on my mind and my self-esteem and my energy level. It really did. And uh, I, I, I think it's had an effect on me. We have a couple more minutes to talk about the, your next big plan for uh, summer of 2012, um, uh, www.www. Uh, is that new Ted? What is it? No. No, no. I'm starting from zero. I'm having it in August. Nobody else has a conference in August. You wouldn't have a conference in August. Why would you have a conference in August? I mean, everybody's away in August. Nobody's going to go to a conference in August. That's when I'm going to have the conference. Uh, <laughs> And I am, uh, I, I will really announce it with some details in January, but I have amazing partners that are gonna be helping me, like Chris Anderson will be. Uh, the, the, the current operator, owner operator of Ted. He will be helpful in it, and Jack Dangerman will be helpful in it, and John Kamen, and probably Mark Hodosh, and, uh, and probably, uh, almost certainly, uh, 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 Jay Walker, who started Priceline, and maybe Walt Wasberg. So I'm getting, people 
who uh, are extraordinary, all smarter than I am, as ways of making it wonderful. And, uh, and I'm going to develop a different way for people to talk. This is semi-interview, but it isn't really equal because I haven't given you equal time. And it's, I know, and I apologize. Uh, because the really was going to be set up that I would interview him and he would interview me, and it hasn't happened that way, and I apologize, but I can't help it. I forgive you. Uh, uh, but I would want to have conversations uh, with the structure of jazz between people of great minds having conversations about a subject. At, at TED Med this year, I had Quincy Jones, Frank Gehry, uh, Moshe Zafdi and me. It was called Three Old Jewish Architects and a Black Cat from Chicago. And we, we were talking about their aches and pains. And we just sat there, and there was no agenda, and we didn't interview each other. We just sort of talked about stuff. It wasn't bad. I thought it was going to be a disaster. He was, he was there. It was, it was OK. And it was a model for how do you rift back and forth with people who respect each other about a narrow subject, maybe outside of themselves, and and tell the truth, and not show off your wares, not, not show off your skills, not tell about this great idea and show slides, but just have a conversation, great minds having a conversation that is revelatory and makes everybody more human. That you would, you would think, that's OK, Miss Bush, being more human, OK. Um, Sign me up. Richard Saul Warman, thank you very much. <laughs>